morning and welcome to our service of worship here at Kaunisti Panbride Church. It's good that we can meet together, whether um, we're meeting, uh, watching online or via the phone service, it's good that we can still stay connected as the body of Christ. So thank you for joining with me. Our call to worship uh, is inspired by today's gospel reading from Matthew's gospel. In the name of the Lord Jesus, the bread breaker, the light gatherer, the cross carrier, welcome. May the peace of the Lord Jesus, the peacemaker and the temple disturber, friend of the sinner and companion on the road, be with us all. Let us draw close now to the Lord Jesus, the saviour, the healer, the teacher, and let's worship him and ask ourselves this day who do we say he is we begin our worship as usual by singing praise to god and when we eventually move back into our buildings and we'll hear more about that later in the service when we reopen the church buildings for worship we might still not be able to sing our hymns um, and that's because of the greater risks of greater risk of aerosol particles being spread. And so I encourage you and I invite you to sing along with gusto to the hymns. I've put the lyrics on the screen alongside the music and I know that some of you do sing along. And you don't need to worry if you're not in tune or if you can't sing very well. You can sing as loud as you want. Let's worship God by singing together for the beauty of the air. and confession and the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. 
Loving God, we come to worship you, creator, redeemer, sustainer. You are the one in whom we live and move and have our being. We thank you that we can open our hearts to you, that we can pour out our innermost souls and share our deepest thoughts in the knowledge that you are there and always ready to listen and understand. So once more, we lay our lives before you, open to your gaze, most holy God, the bad as well as the good, the doubt as well as the faith, the sorrow as well as the joy. And so, Lord, knowing that your compassion never wavers, we're confident to confess our sins before you. And we confess, Lord, that we often struggle to be your disciples. We allow the world to shape us and the demand of our daily life to pull us away from you. Lord, have mercy upon us. Forgive us that despite your great love for us, we fail to love each other as you have commanded. We often keep our hearts closed and locked up, imprisoned by unforgiveness, pride and selfishness. Forgive us, we pray, and create in us clean hearts that we might glorify you in our living and reveal you in our loving. Refresh our weary spirits that we might boldly proclaim Jesus as Lord and Saviour and witness his love and saving power to a tired and hopeless world. And hear us now, O God, as we pray the prayer Jesus first taught his disciples. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. David Ross reads our scripture passage this morning. Today's reading is taken from Matthew chapter 16 reading verses 13 to 20. Peter's Confession of Christ When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he warned his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. Amen. So what's in a name? Quite a lot, apparently. Our name sets out our individuality, our identity, who we are. When people call us by our name, it implies they know us, or at least they know about us. And there's a certain familiarity in our relationship, intimacy even. And so I always try and remember people's names and call them by their name. Perhaps that comes from my early childhood. Being the youngest of four daughters, my mother would often try to attract our attention and she would shout, Kathy, Mary, Elizabeth, Annette. And for a while I actually thought that was my name. And later, when I was older, I asked my mother, why, why did you do that? Why, why did you call all our names at the same time? And her answer to me was, well, I knew at least one of you would answer. Later in life, I had another name. I was known as the Twins Mum. And sometimes Mrs George 
And more recently, an elderly gentleman asked me, so what do I call you, the lady minister? And I said, Annette, Annette is fine. And names are important, especially in a hospital or care home setting. When everything else has been taken away from us, our independence, our privacy, sometimes even our dignity, then it's comforting to hear someone speak our name, to remind us of who we are despite what is happening to our bodies or to our minds. Sometimes when everything else has been taken from us, all we have left is our name to remind us of who we really are. In our reading this week, Jesus is making his way through the villages of Caesarea Philippi, 25 miles or so north of Galilee. Again, like last week, it's a place where the Jewish crowds will not follow Jesus, and so Jesus has peace to rest uh, and to teach his disciples. Caesarea Philippi uh, was a place where there was a great temple built by Herod the Great in honour of Caesar. And there was also many other temples uh, relating to other gods and other religions. And it's significant that, that it is against this backdrop that Jesus asks his disciples to name him. Asks them if they know who he really is. Asking them... Are they aware of his identity? These same disciples who are going to take his message to the Gentiles, to the ends of the earth. Jesus by this time knows his days on earth are numbered and being recognised as the Messiah is crucial for the survival of his church. Jesus has to be sure that the disciples recognise him as Messiah to know that before he sets out for Jerusalem and death on the cross, that they have grasped who he is and what he is about. Unlike any good teacher, he encourages them by starting off with a simple question, one that they're sure to know the answer to, and he says to them, who do people say the Son of Man is? And the disciples are on safe ground here. Jesus is only asking them to tell him what other people are saying about him. And so they offer their answers. People think he is a prophet. John the Baptist, Elijah or Jeremiah even come back to life. But then he asks them a more searching question. What about you? Who do you say I am? They might well have answered, well, we know who you are. You are Jesus, the carpenter's, carpenter's son from Galilee. But what Jesus is really asking is, but who am I to you? What do I mean to you? After all the miles that we've travelled together and the meals that we've shared, the things that we've been through together, the tough times, and the times of laughter. This is not just a question to see if they can get Jesus' identity correct, it's also a question about their allegiance to him, their relationship with him. Simon Peter, and it was always going to be Peter, wasn't it? Bold, impetuous Peter, he answers, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus then blesses Simon Peter. And using a little play on words, he says, you are Peter. And the name Peter in Greek is Petros. And the name for rock or stone is Petra. Sometimes used in Greek interchangeably. Jesus says, and on this rock I will build my church. And we know enough about Peter to know that he wasn't a rock-like person. He wasn't a solid, dependable type of guy. So perhaps we have to understand that the rock Jesus refers to is the rock of Peter's confession as Jesus the Messiah. But as William Barclay puts it, Peter is not the rock on which the church is founded. That rock is God himself. Peter is, by his confession, the first member of Jesus' church. And then Jesus says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom. 
I will give you authority to usher people into the kingdom of heaven. In direct contrast to the religious elite, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees who are always trying to shut people out of God's presence and to keep the doors locked firmly. And if we didn't know anything more about Peter, we might congratulate him. We might think that it's like an episode of The Apprentice. Here is the one out of all the other disciples who is worthy. And not only does he get Jesus' blessing, but he's also been handed the keys of the kingdom. Peter is exceptional amongst the disciples. Somehow he has put it all together and arrived at the right answer. He has been paying attention all along to the sermons and the miracles, and he has now, he has now graduated with distinction. But Jesus tells him, this isn't something that you got to in your own thinking, Peter. This is something revealed to you by God. This isn't a human revelation. This is divine revelation. And we only need to read a few verses further on from our reading today uh, to find that Peter will mess up big time, despite this blessing and commendation from Jesus. When Jesus speaks to his disciples of going to Jerusalem and his impending death, Peter says, Lord, that shall never happen to you. And then Jesus rebukes his cum laude student with words we find shocking. Get behind me, Satan. You, Peter, are not thinking in spiritual terms, but in human terms. Peter knows who Jesus is. He confesses him as Messiah and as the anointed, anointed one of God. So despite knowing who Jesus is, he still gets it all wrong. And isn't that so human? And maybe that is just a wee bit comforting for us disciples who struggle to make the grade on a daily basis. In our passage this morning, Peter, this often fickle and unreliable disciple, must be basking in the glory of getting it right at last. He answers Jesus' question correctly and is blessed and commended. Awarded the keys of the kingdom, spiritual authority to witness before God and to bring people into that kingdom. But we know that this is Peter, the same man who will soon deny Jesus three times, deny even knowing Jesus three times to save his own skin. Like Peter, we know Jesus' name, Messiah, Son of the living God. But just like Peter, we often fail miserably to know what those names actually mean, to articulate what they mean to us. What would we say today if Jesus were asking us, what about you? Who do you say I am? We might be able to confess Jesus with our lips, but do we confess him with our heart? Do we believe in our hearts that he is master, Lord, friend, saviour? And if we can grasp that, if we truly believe that in our hearts, then we know that even if, like Peter, we do mess up, that's never it with God. Even if we fail to make the grade, as we go back to the, the illustration of the apprentice, it doesn't mean that we would hear Jesus say, you're fired. Just look at how God used Peter. Peter, who was always getting it wrong, always getting into trouble and being rebuked. And yet Jesus says to Peter, feed my lambs. And on the day of Pentecost, Peter is given the courage through the power of the Holy Spirit to preach to thousands of people, to unlock the gates of heaven for them through the power of the Spirit. So what do we say when Jesus asks that same question of us? Who do you say I am? If we turn and say to him through the revelation of the Holy Spirit, you are Messiah, you are the son of the living God, 
You are my master, my friend, my saviour. God gives us to, even today, the keys of the kingdom. Just like Peter, that first member of the church, we, by our confession, by our witness, we too are given spiritual authority to unlock the doors, to open up the gates of the kingdom of heaven for others. Amen. And again, and though the tune may be familiar to you, uh, the words are new. This is a hymn uh, by Reverend Tom Gordon, and he wrote uh, the words just recently uh, as he reflected on this passage that we read today. And Tom says this, Am I good enough to be a disciple? Or will I ever be acceptable to God? How little we can know or understand of God's grace and how massive that grace must be to accept and use the lights of me. The hymn is called You Call My Name, and I hope you will enjoy singing along or just allowing the words to settle in your heart. Lord, we bring you our prayers of intercession, knowing that you hear each prayer and see each need. We pray for all those in our world who seek to serve you and to do your will here on earth. We remember those who work for peace, who campaign for justice, who strive to relieve poverty and who fight for the hungry, that they might know your blessing and your protection. We pray for your church that it might continue to work for the good of others. We remember all who exercise the gift of ministry, teaching, healing and service within your church. And we pray for our Kirk session and our congregational board and all our hard-working volunteers as we begin the long and complex process of reopening our church buildings. We pray for those who have recently gone back to work in schools in the hospitality industry, in shops and in all the places which are now beginning to reopen. We pray your protection, Lord. And we pray also for sensitivity and understanding for those who are afraid or anxious to go back to work or to places of leisure and entertainment. Loving God, we pray for all who long to come to worship again in this church. 
to be in the body of the kirk with friends and family, amongst those who love them in Christ's name, to share worship and fellowship once more. And we are conscious, Lord, that it might be some time until we are all together again, until we see some of our beloved brothers and sisters here in your church building. And so, Lord, we pray that they will know that they are still remembered, still loved and still valued, still cared for and missed so much. May we continue to find ways to be together and to show our affection and support. And may they know your presence always close by their side. We pray for ourselves. Transform us by your love into the disciples you would have us be. And may we always witness to you in our lives and confess you with our lips and work always for your praise and glory. Through Jesus the Christ, the Anointed One, the Messiah, the Son of the Living God, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, world without end. Amen. Last Thursday evening, the Kirk session met by Zoom, and a decision was taken then to reopen the church for a short service of worship from the 20th of September. And although we're excited about that, there are lots of things that we have to get in place, that we have to get right before we can welcome back those who want to come back into our buildings for worship. Lots of preparation has to take place before then, and the Kirk Session and the Congregational Board will be working hard between now and then to ensure that all the necessary safeguards are put in place to keep everyone as safe as possible. Before we reopen, we have to complete a COVID-19 checklist and a risk assessment and have presbytery approval. In the August update, which uh, you will receive shortly over the next few days, you'll find in the update information on what uh, coming to church for the foreseeable future um, might look like. You will be required to wear a face mask and keep two metre distance inside and outside the building. You will be required to sanitise your hands on entering the building and as you leave. You will have to observe the one-way system inside the building and you will be shown to a seat. The windows and the doors will be left open for ventilation, so do bundle up. And we will ask for your name and your phone number as part of Test and Protect. And at the moment, as I said, we will not be able to sing. And after all of that, if you still want to come, you will be welcome. But because of numbers, uh, we have to significantly reduce, reduce who, we, who comes into the building uh, because we've got to keep to the two metre distancing. So you will have to register in advance to attend a service. And I'll tell you more about that as we get nearer the time. We'll also ask that if you are in a high risk group or you're living with someone who has just come out of shielding, that you seriously consider whether you should come to church. Our main service of worship until the day that we can welcome back all who want to come to worship uh, will remain online. We will continue at the very least to have a Sunday service, a Sunday morning service of worship on YouTube, Facebook and our website. As I said, to be able to reopen the church we want to do that as safely as we possibly can and we have to, we're required to observe a high standard of hygiene and cleanliness within the building and to clean the church thoroughly during the service and between services. We're very blessed in this church that we have a wonderful committed team of cleaners who over the years have helped clean keep this church spick and span and saved a, a small fortune in cleaning. And I think they go by the name of the Divine Dusters, what a wonderful name for our teams of cleaning cleaners. But we're sensitive also that 
people within those teams might not want to be in the church just yet. And so we're looking for more volunteers to join the Rota. So if that's something that you think you could help with, uh, please contact, uh, in the first instance, Pat Taylor on 012-41-853-919 and Pat will be able to give you more information. I already have the names of a few people who have already kindly uh, offered their assistance uh, and I'll be in touch with you shortly. We're still collecting for the food bank and if you have any items for the food bank, please do leave them at Mary Bushnell's door or indeed the man's door if you can do that safely. Next week in our service, we will celebrate the sacrament of Holy Communion. So please do, some ha do have some bread or, and wine or juice as you, we gather together. Until we meet again. In life, in death, in life beyond death, Jesus Christ is Lord. Over powers and authorities, over all who govern the life of the world, Jesus Christ is Lord, of the poor, of the broken, of the sinned against and the sinner, Jesus Christ is Lord. Above the church and beyond our best thoughts of him and the quietest corners of our heart, Jesus Christ is Lord. The blessing of the Lord God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you and all whom you love, this day and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>